Right, on to the Republican race for the White House. A man many consider a fringe candidate just won't stay on the, head, on the sidelines. We're talking about Ron Paul. He won a GOP straw poll Saturday in Iowa with a whopping 82% of the vote. Goldie Taylor, independent and political analyst, joins us now. You are shaking your head. I Up and down. Because <laughs> I recently interviewed him. He is a tell it like it is guy. You can't help but he's a nice guy. You can't help but 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 like him. I was sitting around with some friends. We were all on Twitter talking about the last debate and a lot of us said, Oh my gosh, Ron Paul is making sense to us. And so it was a it was, you know, a surprising thing. I was on a plane today coming back in from Florida and the fellow next to me and I just started a conversation and mm -hmm. we landed on Ron Paul and this straw poll. The fact is, he has the organization, he has the volunteers. Okay, okay, I get it. You're going to go money. on and on, you're going to give me a laundry list, but what? He's going to be successful in changing the conversation. And the real threat is not what he does in this GOP primary. If he becomes a third-party candidate. If he candidate, runs yeah? as an independent, ah, okay. it changes everything. And i got to tell you, I don't count him out of winning Iowa. Really? Not at all. Mitt Romney can't take Iowa. Kane doesn't have the organization or the money in Iowa, no staff. Ron Paul can turn them up and turn them out. Yeah, this is going to be so, such an interesting election. I mean, to, to be able to cover it is, is a privilege because it's going to be just craziness, madness, mayhem. It's going to be madness. Yeah. The GOP is so incredibly fractured, and that's what's giving Ron Paul the real opportunity. Okay, let's uh, the State of the Union with Candy Crowley. Uh, federal student loan programs should be abolished. Let's listen to Ron Paul. Anybody who's uh, ambitious enough will get to go to college. The problem is, is college costs too much. And with the good intentions of giving people houses at discount, you know, ends up with a housing bubble, and the people who are supposed to be helped, they lose their house. Same way with education. The attempt to help people in education, all you do is you don't get better education. You end up uh, actually pushing the price of education up. So we've delivered uh, now uh, hundreds of thousands of students graduating with a trillion dollars worth of debt and no jobs. So it's a totally failed policy. That kind of talk doesn't turn off voters, does it? That kind of talk turns voters on because nobody else is speaking that truth. Yeah. There are colleges and universities out there, you see them on television every day, mm -hmm. um, that literally cater their tuition costs around how much federal aid they predict their students can get. The more student aid they think students can get, the higher they set the tuition costs. And so he's right. It is driving some of the escalation in cost of education. I've got three kids in college. I know what this game is like. The debt load they're going to have when they're out of college and not having a job and maybe paying up to half of their disposable income and paying back student loans, I mean, God help them if they can realize this American dream and not be saddled with all the debt. And so Ron Paul is making sense. Uh, to pick three in college? Three. My gosh, can you afford gas? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, serious. I I'm serious. I'm <laughs> serious. Okay, so I'm not going to debate. Okay, now I'm going to debate. I'm talking about Rick Perry. How is this, does, does it make him seem like a flip-flop, or how is this playing? Well, there are a couple of things at play here. First of all, if he chooses not to debate, it gives you know, uh, Mitt Romney an excuse not to debate. And that leaves a lot of second-tier candidates you know, out there on the mm -hmm. field. And so that's the complication here. But if I'm Rick Perry, and I've performed in this way for these several debates so far. I'm not sure if I continue to do that kind of self-inflicted damage. And maybe I take a different course. Mm -hmm. And so I think a new strategy is coming together for Perry. He's got to do it quickly. But can he continue to suffer the kinds of blows that, he ha that he's had in debates? I don't think he can. Uh, in a short time left, I want to ask you this because I, I appreciate your perspective on these situations. Okay, let's just say that the reality of Obama versus Cain happens. Mm -hmm. It's been bubbling up. You've heard yeah. it. This is the end of racism. One, one radio host said, Racism is officially o over if that happens, because Samuel L. Jackson is, is the number, is number one uh, movie star of all times, and then you have two black men running for president. A dear friend of mine said, we'll know that racism is over when Samuel L. Jackson can play the part of George Washington. <laughs> That's when we know we're in a post-racial America. You know, to say that we are, you know, living in this, you know, dream world of race and gender and all of those things don't matter. Yeah. You know, we're not in a colorblind society, that's for sure. Certainly things have progressed, but yeah. when you start with the issue of slavery, everything looks like progress. Yeah. It's a simplistic headline, but if you go beyond that and have a deeper conversation, it's, it's, you know, it makes sense to have that conversation. I think if we've got that. them both in the race at the same time, yeah. we might have a conversation. Thank you, Goldie Taylor. Appreciate it. Thank you. Occupy Wall Street's 99% mantra could become a big election issue. So.
Are any of the presidential candidates in that income bracket? Are they in that income bracket? That's ahead, but first, 